Welcome to this Total War Three Kingdoms Let's Play, where we'll be looking at heroes and the Guan Xi system, the beating heart of the game. Now this is probably one of the most complex Total War titles that we've released today, so please sit down, grab yourself a whole bucket of popcorn, and ready yourself for one of the longest Let's Plays I've ever done. I'm Wheels, and today I'll be playing as Liu Bei, legendary commander and virtuous idealist. Let's take a look at the story so far. Beginning our campaign in the iron mines of Dong Commandery, we established our territory on the banks of the Yellow River. As our lands grew, our neighbor and friend Tao Chen pleaded with us for aid as a corrupt official in his court ignited a war with the dangerous warlord Cao Cao to the south. We honorably pledged to join Tao Chen in his defense and stop Tao Tao in his tracks before innocents were harmed. But just as soon as it started, our friendship found its end when Tao Chen, pushed by the stress of the war, fell to the cruelty of old age. On his deathbed and moved by our noble actions, Tao Chen offered up his lands and court to us so that we could lead his people to glory with our factions joined in confederation. Liu Bei seeks to bring unity to the land and his unique faction currency will increase as long as he keeps those who serve him happy with his rule. A number of things will increase this, but the main way to gain it is by keeping the members of your court satisfied. You can then spend unity to convince Han officials of your legitimacy and annex their holdings without bloodshed, but keeping an ample supply will provide its own boons. Liu Bei is a commander, one of the five different classes of hero in Three Kingdoms, each one bringing their own unique skills and abilities to both the campaign map and the battlefield. Commanders like Liu Bei are masters of a happy court and soldiery, using their authority to raise the satisfaction of their subordinates and keeping the morale of their soldiers high. Sentinels are artisan builders and are stout in battle, able to lock down choke points and enemy heroes, as well as inferring their defensive skills on their infantry. The Vanguard excels at shock battle tactics with rapid cavalry charges and can recruit units to an army with greater efficiency, saving vital funds. Your champion will be able to outduel any opponent with supreme melee ability and vitality. As a leader of the people, they bring bountiful growth to the peasantry. And finally, the Strategist, who brings agile and lethal formations to his forces and can outwit any rival, will annihilate your opposition in a hail of arrow fire and artillery. These characters are the lifeblood of Three Kingdoms and will act as your leaders, generals, politicians, governors and spies. Looking to our current campaign, we must first complete our Siege of Longyear. To complete our current mission and establish a new power base for the birth of our empire. Our advisors predict defeat against the city walls. They do not know the strength of our unity. Victory is ours, and these puppets of the tyrant Dong Zhuo threaten us no longer. With that, our mission is successful, and we can now look to strengthen our position further. After that well-fought battle, Liu Bei and his timeless ally John Fei have gained a new rank. Each class of character comes with their own unique skill tree, granting a variety of powerful effects. Depending on the type of person they are, different characters of the same class can start in different areas of the skill tree. My recently espoused wife, for example, starts more centrally due to her nature as an outsider. Skills can affect a wide variety of things depending on how your character is deployed. Some will affect the combat skills of their personal retinues or be applied to the entire army that a character is deployed in. Some will give bonuses to the lands that a character governs and others will give powerful abilities to your character in combat. All of these skills, however, will improve the five attributes that are the makeup of all the characters in Total War Three Kingdoms. A character's attributes define their effectiveness in different aspects of your campaign. For example, as a commander, Liu Bei is naturally authoritative, giving a huge boost to the morale of his retinue and a faction-wide benefit to the satisfaction of the members of his court. 
The instinctive John Fay, however, brings a huge bonus to his damage dealing ability and can help cut costs when mustering forces. If we increase John Fay's instinct by investing in the Fury skill, we can see those benefits improve. Characters are not one dimensional though, and by investing in the right skills and giving the right equipment, a vanguard can be just as authoritative as their commander companions. The way in which you manage these characters is at the heart of everything in Total War Three Kingdoms. They are the most important and powerful assets your faction has, and potentially the most dangerous forces you'll have to deal with in your campaign. Speaking of managing our characters, after the big merger with the late Tao Chen's faction, a few new faces have joined our court. Though some have begun to adapt to life under my rule, Tao Shang's employment has not been as smooth. As the previous heir to Tao Chen's throne, Tao Shang is understandably vexed after being demoted to a low-level court position under my rule when his father passed away, leaving his lands to me. Because of this, he now harbours an internal resentment towards my court and has taken a huge hit to his satisfaction. His time in my court may not last long. For now, we'll end the turn and see what becomes of him in the winter. It's a bitter winter in ancient China, and Cao Cao's borders grow closer to ours as he takes more of Chen Commandery. At home, our suspicions were realized as Tao Xiang has officially departed our court in search of more gainful employment. Characters in Three Kingdoms do not cease to exist when they leave a faction. If the court in which they were employed was not satisfactory to them, or if their faction ceases to exist, they will wander the lands searching for a new master. Tao Xiang left because his satisfaction hit zero. A character's satisfaction rating shows their overall opinion of you as a ruler and the position they have under your employ. Things like having close friends with them in court or on military campaigns, a big fancy title with matching salary, or being gifted with lots of fancy trinkets will increase it. Equally, being employed in a faction where you're never given anything to do, you work with people you hate, and you receive no recognition for your rank will leave you understandably annoyed. The most important aspect of keeping people happy is properly utilizing their talents. With the Siege of Lanier completed, we have reached the auspicious rank of Second Marquis, which has unlocked the ability to assign our characters into ministerial positions. Let's open up the court screen and take a look. From the court screen, we can see all the available positions in our fledgling empire, with further positions being unlocked as our faction rank grows. On the right, we have all the characters willing to offer up their services to our court and the price it takes to hire them. These characters could be newly formed heroes awaiting their first opportunities or ex-members of some prestigious court seeking a new master. Equally, they could be enemy spies attempting to infiltrate our halls. At the bottom, we have all the nobles that currently fly our banners, including my sworn brothers, my wife, and the new nobles that join me in the confederation. More importantly, right in the middle of the screen is the hierarchy of power in our faction, with the legendary Liu Bei himself right at the top as the faction leader. Either side of him are the highest stations that characters in your faction can achieve, the heir to your throne and the prime minister. These roles will define the DNA of your faction as any bonuses that your characters would bestow on your entire court if they were the leader of the faction will also take effect when given the role of heir or prime minister. By opening up our family tree, we can see that I currently have no son or daughter to take my place should I perish in battle. I could adopt one of my court nobles into my family and name them the heir to my holdings, but the costs of the paperwork are a bit out of my reach at the moment. My wife, however, is already eligible, and as a commander, her authority is quite high in comparison to the other candidates, making her a natural fit with the faction-wide satisfaction bonus it brings. As my wife is my only real relative in the faction, no one should turn their noses up at her new position. But should a new heir be born in the future, natural competition will start to arise in my family for the throne. If we look back at the court, we still have a few positions to fill. So let's peruse the candidates that we have on offer. From looking at the character list, we can see straight away that my brother in arms, John Fei, is not quite as satisfied with his position as Guan Yu. 
This is due to one of the other key defining elements of characters, their traits. By looking at Guan Yu's traits, we can see that his fraternal nature is providing him with a natural affinity with those around him, making him more likely to stick around. Not only that, but as a man of honour, he refuses to let his ambitions get away from him, which is why even though my two sworn brothers share the same rank, John Fei's desire for a higher rank in court is providing more dissatisfaction than Guan Yu's. The majority of traits will add to or take away from a character's stats, and some may also provide additional effects, like Gwen Yura's intimidating nature allowing him to scare enemies on the battlefield. Or Gu Pei Shou's superstitious nature randomly triggering events for the faction. Let's go back to our court screen and assign a new Chancellor. As John Fei is the most aggrieved by his lack of title, he seems like a good choice for the role. His new position of Chancellor will provide us with a faction-wide benefit to public order and the income that we receive from the peasantry. This role is quite prestigious, and it will keep him happy with his position all the way up to rank 8. After that, he will start to covet a higher position, and his satisfaction will once again start to waver. Satisfaction for your small council members is extremely important, as a noble of his stature leaving your court will trigger a full-blown civil war in your lands so select your council carefully. We can remove him from his position in the future, but doing so would cause a huge rift between you and the character. With his brand new position, John Fay is now absolutely ecstatic. Let's hope that his drunken buffoonery doesn't make me regret my decisions. With John Fay now appointed as our new chancellor, his wages have increased considerably. Seeing as his satisfaction is through the roof after his new position in the council, I reckon we can exploit his goodwill to drop his title rank a few pegs, and with it, his wage. Perfect. That's put us back in the black, even if only momentarily. Should we wish to raise the satisfaction of another character in the future, and we need a quick fix, doing the opposite and raising a character's title is a good way to score some brownie points, though an increase in rank is a little more costly, as you can see. Now that we have our first council member waiting to serve, let's put him to work in his new role. As a member of the faction council, John Fei can provide us with special missions to enact every five turns, based on what he thinks needs improving around the kingdom. As a vanguard, John Fei is primarily focused on the military, and he spotted a weakness on our border closest to the forces of Taotao. Without an army looking to the south, Taotao could sneak into our territory and take us by surprise. Thanks, Zhang Fei. We'll head out immediately. I'm quickly going to move our force to Pengcheng to make sure we have someone on the front lines should Tao Tao decide to march on our lands. But for now, let's end the turn and bid goodbye to this harsh winter. Contemplation is required. Spring brings colour back to our lands, and news on the wind that plans are in motion to turn the tyrant's adopted son against him. Closer to home though, more troubling events have taken place. The conniving warmonger of Tao Tao has laid waste to our southern neighbours, and now he builds his forces in Pengcheng, waiting to enact a second assault on our lands. And mustering just outside the town walls is a familiar but not welcome sight. Tao Shang, previous heir to Tao Chen's lands, has not just left our court, but joined Tao Tao's forces to enact his revenge against us. Here he lays, assembling his forces, waiting for a chance to strike. If we let them continue to build their armies, we'll soon be overwhelmed. We need to make plans to stop them in their tracks, and fast. Before that though, let's make sure the situation at home is stable. Over the passing of the seasons, a new follower joined our court. A scholar that can improve the rate at which our heroes learn new skills. This follower is one of the many different ancillary items that you'll be able to equip your heroes with during your campaigns. Broken down into their battle equipment, their trusty steed, their trusted companions, and the trinkets they hold. The weapons your character hold, for example, will change their fighting style in battle. Equipping dual Jian will increase their damage output, 
but reduce the effectiveness of dodging blows that comes with having a spare hand free. As a commander, Liu Bei can only equip the items that match his class, and as such, the mighty halberd and spear that his brothers bring into the fray are unavailable to him. All ancillaries come in different levels of quality, ranging from common all the way up to the unique and powerful items known throughout the land. The scholar that has just joined us only applies his effect when equipped on a faction leader, heir or prime minister, so let's add him to Liu Bei's roster and start improving our generals and governors. We have another follower here, the law enforcer, who would be perfect for improving public order in our lands, but Liu Bei only has room for one follower, so we'll have to turn to my wife and recently anointed heir to oversee him. Seems the law enforcer is part of the martial law set. Ancillaries in Three Kingdoms can be combined with other complementary items to give further benefits to those who equip the whole set. Unfortunately, we don't have this particular text, so we'll have to keep an eye out for it as we continue our campaign. Whilst we're giving out the treasures of our faction, we should look towards our upcoming battle with Tao Tao and start equipping our generals to give us as much of an advantage as we can take. This stone axe accessory seems a perfect fit for Zhang Fei. With its increase in instinct, it will also increase the damage output of our front lines. For Liu Bei, this text on the methods of the Sima will increase his cunning, which will give his unique E archers some additional ammunition, as well as also increasing the army's military supplies each turn, which will allow us to survive a lengthier campaign. One of the followers that we didn't assign was this diviner. His foretelling of victory should improve the morale of our soldiers, but we can only benefit from his effects if the character he is equipped to is leading their army. At the moment, Liu Bei is currently the commander of his force, denoted by his leftmost position in the unit bar at the bottom here. As he's already using his follower slot, we can reassign one of our sub-commanders to the head of the army. To see who would be a better fit, we can open up the effects panel for a catch-all list of every single effect this character gives and when. Gwen Yu here would be great at stopping attrition and allowing us to replenish when the battle is over, but Zhong Fei's ability to break enemy morale seems a better fit. Let's equip him with the Diviner, and then we'll appoint him as the commander of the army. Also, as a cavalry specialist, this shabby Fei's red horse here, seems a pretty abysmal mount for the new leader of my army. Let's equip him with this beautiful thoroughbred, which will improve his combat efficiency tenfold. Now that we're more than adequately equipped for battle, we should assess the chemistry of our generals themselves. With a good mix of heroes in your army, you might think yourself ready for any battle, but should those heroes find each other insufferable, the clash between them could cause rivalries and leave your general satisfactions wanting. Every character in Total War Three Kingdoms has a core set of philosophies that they live their lives by, defined by their experiences and traits. Zhang Fei is passionate about those he considers friends and lets his intimidating presence and impulsive nature guide him. When placed in court or an army with characters that share complementary traits, relationships can form between the two characters. Zhang Fei and his sworn brothers have very sturdy relationships backed up by a long history of positive events and coinciding opinions, and as such have reached the oath sworn level of relationship. These characters will gladly put their lives on the line to defend each other, and if they were to witness one another fall in battle, they would be thrown into a murderous rampage. As Zhang Fei shares court with those he calls friend, his satisfaction naturally increases as well. Though you may start with only a few relations, as you progress through the game you will encounter more and more other characters who you will either break bread with or curse their name. After joining Tao Chen in war against him, Tao Tao's relationship with Liu Bei has certainly diminished. These relationships will affect almost all of the systems in Three Kingdoms, from the way in which factions treat each other, where courtless characters will offer their services to, and even in the way that these characters will talk to each other in battle. When checking the compatibility of characters, hovering over this icon on your character list will give you a quick red slash green icon to denote whether your time spent together will improve or decrease relationships. We're almost finished preparing our army. But first, we have a couple of slots left in Gwen Yu's retinue for some new units. When selecting new units for a character's roster, it's good to select units that are complementary to their skill set. As a champion, Gwen Yu is well suited to leading spear and halberd infantry, like these medium and heavy spear guard. Some units available to characters will be unique to your factions, like these E archers, whilst others will only be available to your class, 
like the aforementioned Spear Guard or these awesome hybrid Azure Dragons that we'll be able to recruit once we hit rank 8. I'm going to recruit some of these Heavy Spear Guard to bolster our numbers a bit. Doing so will add a half strength unit to Gwen Yura's retinue, which will take time to muster to full strength. They won't be quite as strong when we rush them into battle like this, but needs must. A character's retinue will stick with them wherever they travel, and can be split apart from their army or undeployed without disrupting their unit composition or experience. When deploying a new army, characters will spawn with their retinues ready to muster their forces back up again, with the cost of deploying them raised to reflect the cost of their new army. My wife, Liu Hui Min, will be a good choice for keeping my homeland safe as I march into Tao Tao's camps. We've got this lovely set of armor here as well that should keep her safe. When you equip your characters with ancillary items, their character art and in-game model will change to reflect their new gear. And with that, I think we've done enough preparation. It's time to take the fight to Tao Tao and press our fleeting advantage. Do not yield. Show no pity. Our siege was costly, but we have emerged victorious. And although that coward Tao Tao has escaped our clutches, his three sub-commanders lay defeated and held at spear point. When you capture an enemy general in combat, their lives are in your hands. By executing them, they will be permanently defeated and any ancillaries they brought with them to battle are yours for the taking. This is seen as an act of barbarity amongst your peers though, further destroying your diplomatic relations with your enemy. Any friends of your victim will also bear an unforgettable hatred towards you as well, but their rivals will be suitably impressed. Should you be feeling more merciful, releasing the character will return them safely to their faction, who will provide a ransom for their fair treatment. However, should the characters you captured not be content with their position in their current faction, they might just be swayed into offering their services to you in exchange for their lives. It must be my lucky day, because both of Tao Tao's cousins have seen the greener grass in my lands, and a jumping ship before their lord's inevitable demise in my hand. I'm seriously strapped for cash right now, and hiring too many new characters into my faction is going to be expensive. So for now, I'll just take the higher level Xiao Hu Duan under my wing. As for Xiao Hu Yuran, we might not have room for him now, but by releasing him honorably, we may just earn his trust should he find himself seeking employment when Tao Tao's holdings crumble in the future. Finally, the petulant Tao Shang with his plans for revenge in ashes around him, Run claims that he would rather masters. die than forgive our transgressions. We have no use for sentimentality, especially towards turncoats. With the balance of power now in our favor and Tao Tao's top general now flying our banner, it is time to go forth and crush his faction into the dust.